Okay, did we all get some values for these? A, E, G, S? A, E, G, S, everybody agree it's two? All right, how about A, E, J, S? Everybody get two? If you're all getting the same answers, I'm not going to stop and look at it. All right, how about E, G, J, S? Two? Everybody get two? So that adds up to six. Let's see if that's my answer. That will help. That is my answer. Yes, that looks right. So we got six. Okay, and what is R5 going to be, by the way? It has to be, because it includes terms that were already zero before. So I get plus six times one factorial. The last term, if it was there, would be times zero factorial, but we don't have anything in front of it. So that's your answer. Okay? You guys remember the forbidden positions? So you can always practice it again. The one on the exam was actually, I think, maybe six, uh, six by six. Oh, it was seven by seven? Oh, that was nice of me. <laughs> they go up to eight by eight for the next time. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there were empty rows. There were empty rows. Yeah, empty rows make it easy. That's true. Oh, that's what it was. If you there were empty rows, if you arranged it the way I wanted you to arrange it, and then some people did the columns, rows and columns were switched. I remember you were one of them. And it was you did fine. It's just that then you got to do all those terms, <laughs> and it just uh, it, it's really kind of tough. So if you do that, if you set up a forbidden positions problem and you realize that there's a lot of rows and none of them are 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 clear of x's, but in the columns you have columns that are clear of x's, I would recommend that you redraw the problem with rows and columns reversed so that you have full rows with no x's in them. Because those basically end up getting ignored because a simple, a simple matter when you're calculating these r values. Okay, let's keep on moving here. Everybody doing okay so far? Everybody awake and alert? I get to sleep in tomorrow? Maybe? No. Um, does anybody have finals on Monday? Some of you do. All right. Okay, let's look at number eight. Um, so the math department, here we go again. I seem to be doing a lot with the math department today. Uh, the math department has six committees. Okay, we have six committees, and um, I guess okay. Um, you know what? I'm gonna change my mind. I'm not gonna do this problem because uh, it's like it's like the one that we did before. I'm gonna let you guys. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna let you guys work on it. Um, or I might come back to it if time allows. Okay, I'm going to move on. Sorry. That wasn't hard. Okay, let's start. Let's go on to number nine. My bad. See, I have multiple examples on here. I just don't want to. I'd rather hit different topics as best I can. Okay, so I'm going to draw a graph. Okay, this graph is going to have two circles inside of each other, concentric circles basically. And on each circle, there is a vertex kind of north, south, east, and west. So that gives us these vertices around the outside of these circles. Okay. Um, there's also another vertex right in the center of both circles. Another vertex right here in the center. Then there's another diagonal, kind of a leftward sort of upper left to lower right diagonal with two more vertices on the smaller circle. And then um, there is another vertex kind of here in the, in the lower left corner and another vertex in the upper right corner of the bigger circle. So that's all of the vertices. And then I just have to draw the connections here. So basically you connect this thing up inside to the outside. So there's your graph. There's your picture. And um, I'm going to label the vertices. So the top is A, the far right is B, way down at the bottom is C, and the far left of the outside circle, those are A, B, C, and D. And then um, going around the inside 
circle, I have E, F, G, H, I, and J. And then the very center uh, point is going to be K. And then I'm going to put M and N. I guess there's no L here. So um, those, are, those are the labels I'm going to use. I skipped over L for some reason. OK, before I go on, I want to make sure everybody has the picture. You either have it drawn, or it's also on the handout, of course. The question is going to be, first question is going to be, is there an, o is there an open or a closed Wetherian trail? So part A, is there an Eulerian trail? How do you decide if a graph has an Eulerian trail? Okay, look at the degree. What is an Eulerian trail, by the way, just to remember the definition? Not every vertex. Let's say again. Every edge gets used exactly once, right? Okay, by a walk. So you walk through the graph and you use every edge exactly once. Can't do it if the graph is not connected, by the way. But this one is connected. Okay. So, and we look at the degree of the vertices, and what was the condition? Let's see. To have a closed Eulerian trail, you remember, you must have every vertex of even degree. To have an open Eulerian trail, you must have exactly two vertices of odd degree. You cannot have it both ways. So you're never going to have a graph that has both an open and a closed Eulerian trail. If there's an open one, I think my biggest disappointment on the, on the second midterm was that I think the graph had exactly two vertices of odd degree. If the graph has exactly two vertices of odd degree, and that, which means you have an open Eulerian trail, that trail must begin and end at those two special vertices of odd degree. Okay, You can't just start anywhere you want. So what about this graph? There's lots of vertices of odd degree, right? There's, uh, so for example, vertex A, vertex E, vertex F, vertex B, vertex C. Lots of vertices have odd degree. So the answer is no. Usually that's an easy question to answer. If there is an Eulerian trail, you'll probably be asked to exhibit it. And that just means you would, you know, you remember this thing where we would write down, you know, whatever. Something like this. Just make sure that, you know, you've written down every edge exactly once, um, and you'll be fine. It works for multi-graphs as well. So if there were multiple edges, that would be fine. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if that happens, make sure that you use the multiple edges however many times they exist. So if I have a multiple edge here, then I've got to use the edge AM from A to M has to show up twice in my, in my list of edges. Okay. So anyway, this is what we have. All right. So there is no other intro. Everybody okay with that? Questions on that? Okay. The second part is: Does this graph have a Hamilton cycle? So, is there a Hamilton cycle? First thing I need you guys to do for me is remind me what does that mean? What is a Hamilton cycle? We visit every vertex exactly once, and we end back up where we started. So we have to not necessarily use every edge, but we do have to get back to where we started. Um, and we do have to visit every vertex. So what do you guys think? How, if this was on the test, what would you do? Okay, if there's going to be a Hamilton cycle, maybe there are certain things you can say about it. And we don't, maybe we don't even know yet what the answer to the question is. It doesn't mean we can't start analyzing it. And say, well, if, if it does exist, we're going to need to use this and this, or can't use this and that. And we'll either arrive at a contradiction, or we'll force ourselves into coming up with a valid Hamilton cycle. Right? We're going to win either way um, if we just push that. Uh, logic through. So, so um, let's explore Alex's suggestion here. Without having the answer to the question yet, are there edges that we know that we would or wouldn't be using? Okay. Um, Nicole, can you give me an edge that we would have to use? Um, that we have to use? Yeah. Or, well, give me an edge that you either know must be there or can't be there. We have to use A to M and M to B. Okay. So
So such a cycle, if it exists, must use, you said A to M and M to B. And why is that? Right, if you look for vertices of degree 2, a Hamilton cycle must visit that vertex, which means you must arrive and leave that vertex. So you've got to have two edges being used, and you only have two edges. So you would have to use oops, you would have to use AM and MB. Okay, are there any others that we could apply the same logic to? Jeremy? CN. CN and ND would have to be used, okay? I'm just going to write those down. So we might be creating our Hamilton cycle, or we might be on our way to a contradiction. We don't necessarily know which, which one, but that's all right. Keep going. Uh, are there any other edges that we would have to use? Heather, do you want to give me an example? Um, okay, these uh, edges right here in the middle, because vertex K has degree 2. So KJ and KG, KJ uh, and KG, good. I'll just say since the degree of K equals the degree of M equals the degree of N equals 2. So because those vertices all have degree 2, we have to use this. Are there any others that are like that? Okay, so you guys have given me one of the strategies that is helpful in analyzing Hamilton cycles, which is looking for uh, vertices of degree 2, because you're forced to use the edges that are incident with such a vertex. Are there any other tricks that we've focused on that we might? What, what other things can we use in this analysis? Yeah, or go ahead. Um, we can use A, D, and B. Okay, if we, if we made A, B, and B, C both blue, if we used both of those edges, what would happen? It would be bad. Right, we would have filled out the entire outer circle, right? Which means I've got a full, complete, premature cycle that didn't visit every vertex yet. Okay, so I cannot use both of them, right? But I might use one of them. So how can we... Build that into an argument here. I mean, do we have to do two cases? Case one, we don't use AD. Case two, we don't use BC. Okay, without loss of generality, exactly. So I'm just going to. Now, why can I do that? It's because of the symmetry of the figure, right? This figure is very symmetrical, kind of about this diagonal right here. Um, if the figure is not symmetrical, then you really can't just sort of say, well, I'm only going to look at one case. Because maybe the other case has a different analysis. But if the figure is symmetrical, meaning that, you know, so in this case it's kind of symmetrical along, along this line, the left side of this line and the right side of that line, the figure pretty much looks the same, then I really can uh, use that analysis. So I'm just going to say, since... Uh, AD and BC cannot both be used, else we get a premature cycle. A premature cycle would be, uh, it's good to give what the cycle would be. So if there's a premature cycle, it would be, you know, A goes to M goes to B, goes to C, goes to N, goes to D, goes to uh, A, right? So we can't use both of them. Uh, so without loss of generality, uh, we choose not to use... Okay, I'm going to let you guys uh, pick your poison. Which one do you want to assume that we don't use? Say again? AD. All right, perfect. I like decisiveness. AD. So if it's if we're not using AD, I'm just going to erase it. Okay. So I didn't use AD. 
So now what? Should I assume that I do use BC? No. I don't want to do that because we might not use either of, the, of those two edges. So I would hate to make that assumption. But I'm specifically going to forget about AB. What does that allow you to then do? OK, good. Because A only has one more edge, and we have to use two edges total, I have to use AE. Anything else we could say? And same reasoning on DI. Okay? OK, so then, thus, we must use uh, AE and DI. OK. Helpful. Any suggestions what to do next? Yeah, maybe. Can't use both EF and FB, so we have to use FB. We can't use both EF and FB, that's because you'd have a premature cycle. So, um, we cannot. Why not? EF alone does not. Oh, I thought EF was, I'm sorry, I thought EF was good. No. No, so we don't know about that one yet. Um, so what you're saying, Davey, is I can't use both EF and FB, so you're going to tell me which one I'm not going to use? Well, I'm going to figure that we have to use FG. Oh, we have to use FG. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we have to use FG. Do you see why? Because if you don't use FG, if you do not use FG, then to visit vertex F, you're going to use both EF and FB, and you're going to make a premature cycle. Exactly right. Does it all follow that? Really good. That's really good logic. So um, we cannot use both. We cannot use both of uh, EF and FB. Else uh, we get A to M to B to F to E to A, which is premature. Okay, so we uh, so we can't use both of those. Okay, so therefore, what we're going to do is only use one of them, which means we must use um, which one was it? FG. Thus, we must use the edge FG. Okay? Must use FG, which is right here. And if I do that, what's the I think we're getting close now. What's the conclusion from there? Say again? I heard it. You can't use G H. Can't use G H. Perfect, right. Because C vertex G? I've now used these two edges, so I can't use G H. Okay. So we can't use GH, can't use GH, and if I don't use GH, then what do we say? We're done. Right here, H, right? Look at vertex H. You've got to visit that vertex, so you're going to have to use IH and HC. Beautiful, okay? So must use IH and HC, which creates a premature cycle, and this, in this case the premature cycle is D to I to J um, to C to N to D. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just yeah, I just copied that. D I H C N D. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Guys, this is about the diff level of difficulty you're going to be seeing. I mean, something like about this much, much work is, is if you can do something that's like at this level or harder, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. There was one on the on the second test that. 
was a little tricky because it actually did have a Hamilton cycle. So it wasn't obvious, but you start doing the analysis, you realize after a while, wait a minute, I just finished making a whole cycle. Um, so don't assume that because you're going through all of this that you're going to end up with a contradiction. Here we did. But it could be that what you end up with at the end of the day is a blue path that actually does the job. And you just couldn't see it in the first place because it's a messy graph. OK, so that's that. Um, are we good with that? i got to go back now and put all my edges back on here because I've got another part to this question. I've got this edge here, and I've got to put this edge here. I guess that's all I have to do. OK. My next question is, what is the chromatic number of this graph? Okay, so part C, what is chi of G, chromatic number? Let's see if we can answer that. Remember, you got to do it in two parts. you got to draw me a coloring that shows the optimal uh, minimum colors, and you got to convince me you could not have done any better. And generally, with something like this, you can, you can just start doing an experiment and just start coloring the vertices, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So I could just start off, get a different color here. I could just start off and say, well, let's make this one red. And then everything that's next to it has to be a different color. So maybe we make the, uh, the one, I've got to be careful because these colors are going to look the same here. So if that's red, then something next to it might be as blue. So these might be, and I can use the same one here and here, and here. So I can use blue on all of those. Now I can try and, as long as possible, just use blue and red. So. A and B are not connected, so I come back to red right there. Right? And where else could I go with red? Vertex J, I could make that red, because that's not connected to A or, or B. N, yeah, N could be red. All right. Anything else? H could be red. Okay. Anything else that we could make blue or red? Either one. The vertex C could be blue, right? So we're trying to do this. With, we're not going to do better than two colors. So we just do it, go as long as we can, try to do it with only two colors. Okay, so we got blue with the ear. What else could we do? G could be blue. All right, I'll put blue on, on vertex G. Okay, and I'm not done coloring it yet. Well, you can see you have some vertices, for example, vertex F is connected to vertices that are both blue and red, so I obviously have to have another color, right? I have another color, so um, I'll just use this marker here. Uh, let's use white. So I'll make this one white, and then can I just, actually, if you notice, the vertices that are not yet colored are not connected to each other, are they? So F and I and K can all be the same color. So if I... If I do that, if I make them all white, then I've got just three colors. Agreed? So the, the chromatic number of the graph, based on my coloring of it, my coloring of it is at most three. How do I know I could not have done better than three? Okay, one of the things we learned is that a chromatic number, the graph can have a chromatic number of two only if it's bipartite. Another way is, and how do you know it's not bipartite? Cycles of odd length. Right? Anytime you have a cycle of odd length, I think you proved this in the homework, is that cycles of odd length always have a chromatic number of three. So for example, the cycles of odd length that I'm thinking about are you know, E, F, G, K, J. These five vertices right here, you're going to somewhere along the line, you can't just keep alternating colors. You're going to need a third color to finish that cycle. Right? It's a very simple principle. You take a cycle of length five, Right? You can try and alternate blue, red, blue, red, but you get to a point where you have to use a different color at the end. So it has a chromatic number of three. So also, chi of G is at least three, C 
since it contains cycles of length. Oh, I'll just say of odd length. If you have a cycle of odd length, you're going to have to do that. Um, do you guys know how to do the uh, spanning tree per graph? Should I ever do that really quick? Spanning tree? Um, I didn't ask you about it on the, on the midterm. By the way, anything I didn't ask you about already uh, is like a, sort of a little gold star in my head. No, I didn't ask you about this yet. I probably should. Um, so a spanning tree is just basically where a tree a tree is just simply a connected a connected graph that has no cycles in it. So what you do is you start removing edges that are part of cycles. That's just like when you when you remove an edge that's on a cycle, it's like removing a non-bridge, right? And you remove non-bridges until everything that's left is a bridge. So you could just take this graph and start erasing edges. So I can think about this cycle E, F, G, K, J. I can say, well, I'm going to get rid of that edge to get rid of that cycle. And there's a thousand different right answers here, right? And here I have a cycle right here, A, M, B, F, E, A. I can get rid of any edge on that cycle. Maybe I get rid of that one, okay? And then I've got another one down here. Maybe I get rid of that one. So you just keep doing this. Here's an edge here I could remove. Anything that's a non-bridge can be removed. And I'm uh, getting close. I still have this whole thing here, so I'll just take out this one, right? And, oh, there's a whole circle around the middle. Oh, by the way, the other thing is, of course, the number of edges in a tree, um, if there are n vertices, do you remember how many edges a tree has to have? n minus 1. So in this graph, we, have, we can figure out how many vertices we have. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on the outside. And then 7, and then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So I know I'll be done when I get down to 12 edges. So I'm going to remove at least one more, maybe this one. And then I can just count my edges here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We're done. Okay? So that's pretty simple. Okay. Um, Lots and lots of problems here. Um, let's see what I want to go to next. Let's try this out. 